first uh, N Net for Society webinar. Um, we uh, today will pre present a webinar uh, on the issue of the open access uh, for SSH um, research. Um, uh, the open access is a priority on uh, all, um, all uh, Horizon 2020, and the socioeconomic science and humanities are um, uh, on the forefront of um, the, uh, the use of open access on the, on the data um, on uh, Horizon 2020 and also in um, uh, FP7 projects. Today's uh, webinar, we'll have uh, two, um, two uh, pre presentations. The first presentation will uh, address the open science for uh, SSH, the open access for publications and the open research data. And uh, of course, the focus on the um, Horizon 2020 requirements. Uh, this presentation will be made by uh, Gwen Frank, that uh, is representing the Open Air uh, Advanced Projects. Uh, then um, um, we have uh, um, room for uh, questions and uh, answers. So we, we invite you to uh, put uh, your qu questions on the chat room you have on this uh, video st uh, stream. Then we will have a second part um, dedicated for the uh, legal and ethical issues by um, Irene uh, v v Vipak. Uh, and of course, we'll have uh, also room for questions after that uh, presentation. So, um, we uh, hope uh, this webinar will be useful for your job. And right now, we'll uh, pass the floor uh, to um, Gwen Frank. Gwen? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can all hear me fine. Um, as Alexandra said, so um, thank you very much for inviting me for the first place. And um, I am here to represent the Open Air Advance Project. Uh, and I want to talk about um, open access to publications and open research data, uh, and especially in the hori in Horizon 2020. Um, I cannot see the slides, Alexandra, so uh, I'm not sure what slide you are right now. Okay, right so, now we um, are just on the yeah. beginning, okay. so... <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes, okay, so what, what I'm going to do today uh, in, the, in the 25 minutes I have is I'm going to talk a bit about what is open air, um, and then I'm, I'm very briefly going to touch what is the European Commission open access policy, what is required and what, what can you do to comply and... Um, then I'll talk about the European Commission Open Data Pilot and policies and, and what does it consist of, focus on research data and research data management. Uh, and also, what can you do uh, to comply? Um, actually, uh, what I want to say before, uh, before we start is that um, I will be touching quite a lot of subjects very briefly. But I really want to point you towards um, uh, Open Air uh, the webinar pages which is actually, um, we have webinars and uh, presentations um, on all of these topics, which is a full, a full hour webinars with, um, with uh, um, you know, like with an with a, uh, associated uh, slide share, uh, slide deck. So if you want to know more about certain things I say and I cannot, cannot answer you properly in the questionnaire, please take a look at these pages and um, we'll be, can maybe somebody else mute the microphone? There's a really annoying echo. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, Open Air, for those of you who don't know, we are a research, uh, an open knowledge and research information infrastructure um, origin, originally intended to, um, to support the first open science uh, uh, pilot, open access pilots in, the, in FP7, in the FP7 framework program. Please, can you? Can you mute? I'm sorry, who is Alexandra? Can you mute your your um, your channel? Thank you, thank you. So um, um, basically, what we are, amongst others, we are a, 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 a network of re interconnected repositories, um, which which allow to link uh, research outputs such as articles and data, uh, together with project information, together with uh, with underlying under uh, linking articles to data sets, underlying data sets. 
Uh, and our aim is actually to facilitate, um, you know, like not only facilitate discoverability of research, but also to stimulate uh, um, researchers to open up their research as much as possible. And, um, and like as a, as a sort of added services to that, we also offer tools for uh, funders and for research administration to, to facilitate uh, reporting because you can very easily generate project lists and, and, and uh, all kinds of uh, metadata from our system. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail on that. We have some, some webinars that really focus on, um, on everything, all services that OpenAir offers. We just want to, uh, to stress that we are a free service. So we are a, we are a European Commission funded project. So um, all the services that we offer are actually uh, costless. Um, next slide, please. Yes, um, what is I think most important for you is that um, one of the services that we offer is, uh, is local help desk. So uh, in every country in the European Union, um, there is a national open access desk and they can offer you tailor-made advice. So uh, if you have any questions after this webinar and uh, you want to know more like for a specific situation in your country, you can go to the page uh, I see the link is not very displayed well there. I will I will paste the, all the, the proper links uh, afterwards in the chat so that you you can just contact your own local NOAA and they can they can answer you in your own language as well. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is an overview of the of the most important services that OpenAir offers for uh, researchers and research administration, which I think is most relevant for you. Um, again, the no your NOAA will be able to help you. Um, uh, and I would uh, invite you to go and take a look at the website uh, www.openair.eu where you can browse um, all our services. Next slide, please. Yes. So um, the reason why we're here is because I want to talk to you about the, the European Commission Open Science Policies. And one of the most, um, the most well-known ones is the European Commission Open Access Policy, which has been put in place um, in uh, Horizon 2020. So I, I just want to, um, to uh, show you what the language is in the grant agreement. So it says, uh, ensure open access as soon as possible and the latest on, on the moment of publication um, with a focus that you have to deposit the machine readable electronic copy of the published version or the final peer reviewed manuscript in a repository. And uh, it should be this, uh, the positions should happen together with the bibliographic metadata, uh, providing the name of the project, the project information. Um, again, this is necessary so that we can that that open air, but also the European Commission can actually interlink interlink the different uh, uh, articles and research outputs and project information to each other. So um, this is the language in the in the grant agreement. I, I I, we put it here explicitly because I do want to stress that this does not say that you are obliged to publish publish in an open access journal. It says that you have to ensure that your research is, um, becomes open as access as soon as possible and that it can also be done by uh, uh, depositing in a repository. More on that later. Next slide, please. Yes. So um, this open access policy in Horizon 2020 is actually... Um, um, a, 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 a continuation of an open access pilot that was already in place in, in the FP7 uh, framework program, um, where it only was only applicable for uh, seven uh, seven areas. Um, and because of that that pilot was quite successful, uh, they decided to to continue this in Horizon 2020 and to make it actually the default policy for for uh, at least for research articles and and, uh, and uh, monographs. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you who have followed the new announcement about the next framework called Horizon Europe, um, open science has actually been uh, one of the six, I think it's six pillars uh, in there. So, um, and it says that it will be go beyond the open access policy of Horizon 2020. It will require uh, open access to publications, to research data and to the research data management plans. Um, I've put in a link to the, to the PDF. Where, where this is stated. So um, this is just to um, stress that open science is here to stay and that um, whether, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to start as soon as possible and to now already have a bit of, of like a, the habits and a routine of providing, of, of making your research output as, as open as possible um, because it will not go away. It will only, the policy will only become more 
enforced into the next uh, uh, framework program. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, very briefly, again, uh, there is a whole webinar ded dedicated to this, of which also uh, I, I took the slides. So please just take a look at our webinar page if you want to more, know more of the details. Um, how to make your publication open access. Um, so first and most important thing is publish in any journal you want. So um, this can be an open access journal, but this can also be a traditional subscription-based journal. But what you need to do is at the moment of um, the moment you have published, you have to uh, deposit your um, research article into a repository. And um, then you, in, in all repositories, you can set an access level. So then you can just say, you can, if your publisher allows it, you can either make it uh, open access immediately or after a, a so-called embargo period. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that you all know what a repository is. For those of you who don't know, that's a, it's, a, it's a digital archive that is either run by an institution or by uh, by a, uh, an independent entity. So uh, it's basically a, a digital archive where you deposit your research. Almost every institution has a repository. So, uh, and if you have trouble locating a decent repository, um, you can always contact your open air NOAD. Um, so this is a, as a between parentheses. So um, basically what, what we want to say is regardless of where you publish, whether you publish in a subscription-based journal or in an open access journal, um, uh, you should just deposit it in a repository. The reason why we focus on this deposit the position process is because we do realize that uh, not all open access journals are suitable for every field of research or for every discipline, either because they're not uh, prestigious, you know, they're not prestigious enough yet. Um, or because uh, they ask for an article processing charge, more on that later, um, that is actually uh, that you cannot, as a researcher, maybe cannot pay or don't want to pay for. Um, important when you deposit research is that you take care of your metadata. So um, make sure that your funder and your grant agreement uh, is, is in there. There are in every repository, there's a metadata field where you can put this. Uh, the reason why is again, so that services like Open Air can, um, they're, they're connected to this repository so they can extract the information from it. So it's a, uh, it's very, it, I mean, it's, it's not much, much use depositing something in a, in a repository and not providing sufficient metadata, metadata because then uh, it's not going to be findable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a little word on, on uh, article and book processing charges or author fees, uh, because um, we know that a lot of um, open access journal charge these. Um, I do want to say that not every open access journal charges, like I think it's about 60% that doesn't charge. There are many open access journals run by institutions or by nonprofits who actually don't charge, but we do know that in most legacy publishers, uh, people, um, journals actually ask for these charges. Um, these charges are an eligible cost in your project, uh, project uh, budget. So uh, it's always useful if you start writing a budget to actually take this into account that you might need and to make an estimation of the number of publications you might make and, and, and to, to include uh, article processing charges uh, into your budget. Um, what I put here is very, is, is just, just for an overview is um, some average article processing charges. Um, so just so you have an idea of what an, an average charge can be, um, a hybrid journal, uh, in case you're not familiar with the language, a hybrid journal is a traditional uh, subscription-based journal that makes certain articles um, uh, open access against the payment. Um, I have to say that uh, we as Open Air and the European Commission in general is not very keen on this because the journal as a whole remains subscription-based and it's only individual articles that uh, that become open access against the fee. So we would we would advise against uh, paying a fee for a hybrid journal. Um, <clears throat> if you want to have more information on fees for publisher, um, you can you can always connect. Uh, you can always uh, consult the Open APC project. Uh, I put a link in there in the slide. Um, and also we at Open Air, we had a, a post-grant open access pilot where we funded these uh, article processing charges. Um, there were quite some very strict conditions. So you can only have three publications funded per project. And uh, we did not support hybrid journals. Uh, and we had a funding cap of 2,000 euro for articles and 6,000 euro for books. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so this is an overview poster of what um, what the results of this pilot were, and I just want to I want to draw your attention to the to the central uh, box, which says that um, the average order fee paid is uh, was fourteen hundred seventy four euros, and the, the median fourteen hundred forty six euros. So um, the reason why I want to mention this explicitly is because we know that in some cases order fees of above. Uh, three or four thousand euros are being asked, and um, that this is not this is this should not be the the rule. In, in general, these author fees are intended to cover the, the 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 loss that the publisher made because the journal is not subscription based anymore, and maybe a bit more to for them to be able to to remain in business. But it's not supposed to be an extort extortionate sum that would you know like be a heavy burden on your uh, on your project. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, but we do realize that while this is we're we in a transition period, so um, we're never going to say that you should publish all your all of your articles in in uh, author fee based open access journals uh, um, because maybe you cannot put all of that in your budget. So um, so that's why we want to I, that's why I want to stress in my first slides that if even if this is not an option or if you cannot find the right open access journal for you or if it's too expensive, uh, please publish in another journal and uh, deposit your uh, your article into the um, into a repository. Um, and one other uh, short remark that I want to make is that um, we do know that some journals are very are maybe not do not meet the quality standards, um, but there are quite some, because this is mainly because a lot of these journals are new. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're badly run. So um, if you want to make sure that the status of your journal is fine, just go and take a look at uh, DOIJ.org, which is a directly open access journal. They do, they vet all the journals that are in there and they now have like a list of I think 9,000 quality open access journals. So just go and take a look over there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, deposit in a repository. So um, you can either deposit in your own institutional repository, um, but you also have um, disciplinary service. And here is where I need your help, because um, I know a lot. I know about a lot of repositories in STEM, but I really don't know if there are any very good ones. And I know uh, good ones in social sciences and humanities. Like I, I, I know there's stuff like humanities commons, like that, but I don't know whether they are well known or whether they are used uh, frequently. So um, at the end of this, my presentation, I will, I will post you a link with this, to a small survey, and I would really appreciate if you, if you know of any repositories that you use if you could just enter it in there so that we know this and we can add this to our to our knowledge database. Um, if you don't if you don't have a proper institutional repository, don't find a disciplinary repository, uh, you can also go to zenoda.org, which is also a European Commission funded initiative and it actually uh, is multidisciplinary so you can add all kinds of research in there. Um, and if you want to look, if you want to go look for a repository yourself, you can also go check the, the links I put on the slide here. Next slide here. Next slide, please. Yes. So what to deposit? Um, in general, we, the European Commission asks for the final peer-reviewed manuscript or the published version and the metadata. So uh, the final peer-reviewed manuscript is also often referred to as postprint. Um, whether uh, if it's not peer reviewed yet, it's referred to as a preprint, but I, I assume you're familiar with the lingo. So there is, and this is in general applicable to all kinds of publications, but there is uh, an emphasis on, on journal articles. Next slide, please. Yeah, so when to deposit, they ask at the latest on, upon publication. Um, so, um, this is about the deposition process. Um, when to provide open access, uh, if possible. So if you either publish in an open access journal or if the publisher allows it, please provide open access at the moment of deposition. Um, if it's not allowed, um, you can do it after, you, there's an embargo period allowed. And for social sciences and humanities, the embargo period is up to 12 months after the moment of publication. So that means that the publication can be in the repository, but not visible, but not accessible. Uh, and after 12 months, you could you should make it open access. Next slide, please. So again, um, 
uh, there's a useful tool called Sherpa Romeo where you can check what your what your publisher allows when it comes to deposition. Um, so uh, it's um, you can just go there and type in the name of your publisher or your journal, and and they will tell you whether you what what exactly can be uh, deposited in your repository. If you're still unsure, please contact your repository manager or your local library, and they will be able to help you out with this. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I've talked about uh, about uh, open access to publications, and now I'm, I'm very briefly going to talk about research data. Um, this is this is uh, I can I can give a webinar of two hours about this, so I'm I'm going to be very short. Again, there's a, there's an entire webinar of this on the open air pages, so just uh, feel free to take a look there. Next slide, please. In brief. What is the research data policy of the European Commission? What does it consist of? The first thing is that it consists of the requirement of providing a data management plan. Um, the second one is that you have to deposit your data in a repository. Um, you have to provide the information to validate res results. So basically, that is what 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 uh, what they mean is that you don't have to post all the data that you can that you generate during your research you have to you have to make sure that you archive and deposit and make available the data that supports your research so in order for it to be uh, reproducible and validated uh, and it can be validated and then as a fourth element it's um it requires you to open up your data as much as possible uh, next slide please Again, I want to I want to point out the difference here. So um, the focus is on research data management. It's not. Um, I mean, of course, uh, we want uh, the data to be as open as possible. But research data management is not is not the same as open research data. So research data management actually is just the process of explaining whatever data you have um, and explaining the metadata um, to have to think about where you're going to store it safely. Where you're going to control how you're going to control access and um, decide, you know, like curate your data. What are you going to keep? What are you going to delete? And then opening opening it up is actually is, is just an element of research data management. But it's not the same. Um, next slide, please. So again, the data that you that you should be uh, considering here is the data and metadata that are needed to validate the results. Um, it's, it can happen that you actually have some raw data as well, uh, and then you are required to, speci to specify this in your data management plan. But again, it does not apply to all data. Um, you don't have to, to uh, archive and open up every single Google spreadsheet you create or something. Um, what the main what they want to do is basically they want you to think about it, and your commission wants to think about your data, and uh, and to and again to make sure that you that at least the data that is needed to validate your results are there. Um, so this means that you you as a researcher have a lot of agency um, to what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. So um, that is just also something to keep in mind. This is not about a blanket policy that requires you to open up all of your research data at once. And as, as I know, you are all in the discipline uh, in, in social sciences and humanities disciplines. What I want to um, what I want to stress here as well that data is also it's not only limited to uh, lab results or spreadsheet with ten thousands of entries. Uh, if you're a literature scientist and you have a literature list um, that you actually use to write. You know, like this is the basis for the articles you write. The literature list can also be considered as research data. Um, uh, an image database of, of, I don't know, medieval buildings is also a data set. So uh, please don't think that this research data management is only a STEM, something for STEM scientists to to um, to consider. It's really something that is uh, applicable for all kinds of research. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, where does this uh, open research data uh, policy come from? In, um, um, in the first phase of Horizon 2020, this was a very flexible uh, pilot. Um, um, and the main motivation for it was actually that they wanted to avoid duplication of research and loss of, uh, of resources. Um, but very quickly, this, I mean, 
this was was channeled into two different uh, two different or two uh, complementary uh, elements, namely data management planning and open access to research data. Um, with uh, I'm stressing that here again. Uh, next slide, please. A generous uh, open opting out policy. So this this refers to what I said earlier that a researcher, you know, like you have a lot of agency as a project or a researcher to just decide whether you, you what you want to make open, how you want to make open it, and what you want to remain that needs to be closed. So you see some reasons that are given to 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 choose to not to participate or to not to participate in this open research data pilot that was uh, in place. Um, and it's it's you can you can uh, completely or partially opt out and and, and again the, the the main motto here is as open as possible and as close as necessary. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Uh, next slide, please. What you need to remember. Um, basically, this is what you need to think about at the start of your project. Um, you should think about writing a data management plan and, and, and have a plan to update it. Uh, you should think about a repository or a location where you're going to store your data. And um, then you also have to, to enter the, you know, like to have to add this, this deposition process and a storage process into your, uh, your project workflow. Um, you're not alone in that. Again, your OpenAir NOAA can, can, can help you out. There, is, there are plenty of EC guidelines. There, uh, there are organizations such as DCC, which is Digital Curation Center in the UK, who are really specialized in helping you out with data management planning and, and research data management. So um, they, can, they can assist you. Next slide, please. So a data management plan. Um, basically, what's in a data management plan is actually a description of how you're going to handle your data during and after the project. Uh, it's important to notice that there is a living document um, so you can it can it can and should be updated. Um, it should uh, consist of elements of curation, preservation, sustainability, and security. And it requires you to think about what parts of your data will be open and not. Again, focus here. Research data management, data management is not the same as open research data. Next slide, please. Yes. So. Um, of this slide, the only thing that I really want to I want to discuss with you or briefly mention is the fair open data, fair data principles, because you will be you, you will be uh, hearing about that for quite a lot in the next couple of years. I can guarantee you that. So next slide, please. Yes. So fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, Essentially, this is a principle that will be in, that will be supported by the European Commission and by I think most open research data policies. So it's useful to to um, to look at the, these elements and then think about how applicable they are for your data. So data should be findable, which means that the metadata and identifiers and then metadata standards and keywords should be. Uh, should be taught about. It should be accessible. Um, it should be uh, interoperable. So again, use the standards and, 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 and correct vocabularies in your own discipline. And it should also be reusable, which means um, I, I hope you can all uh, see that access is not giving access to something. So having a, uh, an object visible is not the same as for it to be uh, reusable. And, and this could mainly be achieved via uh, open licensing. Um, again, there's entire webinars on this subject alone. So uh, if you want to know more, please, uh, please have a look at our webinar page. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So um, just as you have uh, publication repositories, you also have research data repositories. Um, again, you have uh, uh, disciplinary data uh, repositories, you have institutional data repositories. There is a directory, just as Open Door is a directory for publication repositories. Re Retreat data, um, the link is in the, in the slides, is, um, is a directory of da suitable data repositories where you can just filter on your discipline or on your country or whatever you want. And again, um, the Zenodio repository that I mentioned earlier is also can also be used to store data and to link it to your project and your, your, uh, your article output. So. Um, if you're if you're at a loss and, and nobody can and, and you're looking for a suitable repository and you don't know for your data, uh, please go to Zenodo and they will be able to help you. Next slide, please. Yeah, 
um, because this is a question that I get a lot is um, we just publish our data and our publications on our project page. Why should I bother going to look for a repository? And I just want to stress here that having your, your publications and your data on your project page is not enough. Um, first of all, because it's sometimes very difficult to have, uh, you know, to ensure sustainability after your project ends. Um, also, it requires somebody at the service department, it requires somebody to actually uh, work on the curation of the publications and the data set. So it's, it's actually, it's a project, it will be somebody at the project who should be doing that. Um, and then I, I think the main issue is also that, you know, repositories actually have metadata standards and technical standards that in, ensure that everything that is deposited into them is uh, maximal, maximum find, findable. So um, that means that not only by connecting via, um, via repository networks such as OpenAir, but also uh, via uh, common search engines uh, such as Google. Uh, and this is something that you cannot guarantee at the same level when you just publish it on your, uh, on your project website. So please, it's, it's perfectly okay to, to give an overview of your publications on your website. But what I would definitely recommend is that at, if you want to do that, you go um, to open air and it's, it's possible there to look for your project and to generate a dynamic publication list so that your, um, your data and research is stored safely in, in, a, in, a, in a repository. Uh, OpenAir uh, pulls out the information and it gets displayed in a dynamic fashion on your website. Um, that will ensure that there is a, there is a um, you know, like this publication list is, is uh, as up-to-date as possible and it will remove a lot of, uh, of uh, headache for your project management. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, what to deposit? This is actually my final slide. Um, this is just when it comes to open data, you have to deposit and your data and your metadata and the documentation uh, about the data. So in order to ensure the, the reusability and the, and the visibility, um, this will depend on what discipline you're in and what kind of research data you have. I mean, if, you, if your research data is a, is a simple one, one 100 entries per sheet, you might not have to have a separate readme file. But if you're using a specific software, for example, in archaeology, if you're using specific tools or software, it helps to put together with your data and your metadata to, uh, to add a documentation file there as well. Um, OK, so basically, this is the end of my presentation. Um, so um, hold on, hold on. Can you, can you just display the next slide, please? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, so um, this is the link to the survey that I spoke about. It's, it's two simple questions. And the main reason why I want to do this is because um, it does not happen that often that we get to talk to specific uh, social sciences and humanities audience. Um, although I am, I'm a medieval historian myself. Uh, so I'm very interested in, in any suggestions that you have about the open, uh, about first about your background and second about um, any suggestions you have about um, repositories that are su suitable for uh, social sciences and humanities. So um, if you could just quickly go there and, and just enter the code and, and questions, that would be lovely. Uh, and now I'm pasting the final links because I, I noticed some links are were not, uh, I don't know if you can see this in the chat. I'm not, not sure if the chat box is visible for everybody, but I'm sure that the organization of this webinar can, can share these. Uh, with them. And maybe you can just go to the to the final slide, please. No, the next, yeah, the next one. Okay, so uh, if you want to reach us, uh, you can just go to the website, uh, or you can uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can send a general email to the open air, um, to the open air uh, project, but I would definitely recommend that you get in touch with your local NOAD because they will be national open access desk, so they will be able to help you um, you know, like a very in a very very tailor made fashion. So thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you, Gwen, and uh, for your very useful uh, presentation. We have um, um, uh, right now. It is possible to uh, put your questions on the on the um, on the uh, web.
website. You can uh, you can check here a chat room. You please feel free to uh, elaborate uh, your questions right now. We still have uh, two or three minutes for, for questions. Uh, we uh, already um, have uh, one question uh, from uh, uh, ERC researchers. So, Margarida, can you please? Um, Thank say you very much, Gwen, for a very clear presentation. Um, we have a question about the ERC. If a researcher decides to opt out, um, is the researcher expected to motivate the decision? I suppose she needs to justify the researcher, or how does it work for ERC? <laughs> I, actually, I have, to, I have to be honest about this. I don't know. Um, I don't know the specific um, regulations with ERC. I know the ERC um, supports the open uh, science policies of the European Commission. But I do not know what are the specific requirements when you want to opt out. In general, what I would recommend, um, okay. given the given what I explained in, at the beginning of my of my presentation, is that thinking about research data, thinking about your research data management, is a good habit in any case. So thinking about why potentially you would opt out is something that I would, you know, like it's 2018. If you're if you should you, you have to think about it in any case so um if you if you want to opt out i would uh, i would motivate it because it's, it's something is it's a part of the process of you thinking about the research data management about your research data but i am not aware of any uh, what are the specific requirements of the erc thank you Gwen. Uh, we have uh, also um, another question. Um, now th that we already have the horizon europe uh, proposal well, what uh, are, in your opinion, the major changes comparing to Horizon 2020? Um, again, I, I have not read the entire proposal in detail yet, um, but I think that one of the main takeaways when it comes to, to, uh, to open science, at least, is that um, uh, it's very firmly anchored into the, into the uh, you know, like the entire framework. So while in FP7 it was a pilot with very generous opt-out options in Horizon 2020, it was um, it was a policy, but it was not necessarily enforced. I would expect that, uh, given that it's it's very explicitly mentioned a couple of times in the in the in the proposal, and then you know, like in, in the proposal that was made by Moidash uh, end of May. Um, uh, it's, it's, I think it might be uh, reinforced more. So uh, it will not, not longer be, no longer be optional to think about how to, uh, how to make your research open, but it will be something that, that should be an essential part of your, uh, your research uh, life cycle. Gwen, thank you very much again. We are very lucky to have another speaker, uh, Irene. Uh, Irene is a member of Foster Plus the project Foster Plus, and she's also an expert in training, both training of new data archivists and also researchers as data creators and data users. She um, works in the Slovenian social sciences data archives and is also in, uh, in the SESDA, ERIC uh, working group. Um, Irene will talk to us about a very important topic also, which are the ethics ethical issues. Uh, please, Irene, thank you very much. Are you ready to start? Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so, um, Andre, could you please provide the uh, slides so we can start? Uh, yes, as uh, it was already mentioned, um, I work in uh, Slovenian Social Science Data Archives and I'm also leading uh, SESA training working group, of which I'll say a bit uh, uh, later on. I'll be talking today uh, about uh, how to address legal and ethical issues when you do social science research. Uh, namely, I'll be talking about new uh, general data protection legislation and uh, old things that we have uh, as researcher, which is ethics. So next slide, please. 
Um, also, what I would like to mention here uh, is that this information that is presented here at the slides and what I'll be talking about is not legal advice, but is our understanding and interpretation of uh, how this implements uh, and uh, what are the implications for the research and archiving of research data. Uh, so please, whenever you need something on legal, consider your uh, professional legal advice um, uh, in your university or institute. Next slide, please. Uh, just to shortly present uh, us. Uh, so um, Social Science Data Archives was established in 1997. So we're here for uh, about 20 years. Uh, we serve as a national data repository for social sciences. So even though that we are located physically at the Faculty of Social Sciences, we are a national repository. And we hold approximately 600 social science surveys uh, with the data in our catalog and uh, approximately 150 more with just metadata that are either older, so they might have uh, just uh, um, research reports, uh, questionnaires, or their linkages to the international studies, which are archived in um, agreed repositories. Uh, ADP is also a member of CESDA ERIC, um, and uh, so the CESDA is a uh, whole stands for Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. Currently, there are 16 members and one observer. Some members physically are, are countries, and then countries uh, uh, grant uh, service provider inside the, the, uh, the country. And service provider have different rules. Uh, so for example, at the NSD, so Norwegian Center for Research Data, we also have a data protection officials for research and uh, they are officials for 133 Norwegian research and education institutions. So it's different from each uh, repository or archive, uh, what are their obligations. I should also mention one of the things that, that the Gwen was mentioning before. So when you're choosing a, a data archive or repository for the archiving of your data, it's important that you also check whether the repository is a trusted repository and ADP gained a court trust seal at the end of last year, which made us uh, some sort of trusted repository. So it's important that you also see whether a repository have this mark when you choose them. Next slide, please. Um, so the things I'll be talking about today uh, came uh, with the work that we did as a CESDA partners in 2017. Uh, so what you can find on the CESDA webpage is CESDA Data Management Expert Guide. Um, and there are uh, many chapters in it. And one of the important things in there is also that there are some questions that links to data management plans. Uh, and I would also advise that you go and look uh, look at it uh, so you can um, make your life easier in these regards. Next slide, please. So these are the chapters that you can see in data management uh, plan, planning. So it's planning, organizing, processing, storing, protecting, and publishing. Data discovery chapter is going to be ready by the end of 2018. So we will also be able to um, um, find the data through uh, this kind of uh, uh, models. Uh, what you can find in here is a lot of expert tips addressed to both qualitative and quantitative data. And there's a, a lot of information on local diversity, local guides, uh, local law, and uh, exercises that you can use uh, on your, uh, yourself. So uh, today, what we'll be covering is basically the protect chapter. Next slide, please. One more. So why we are talking about this today is because of general data protection regulation that was implemented on the 25th of May, which I guess more of you all know. It applies to personal data and data of living persons. But I should say at this point, there are also national laws that you need to reconsider. So in some countries, this also uh, apply for people that are, let's say, um, dead for 20 years or differently. So please be careful when you interpret these that you need to have in mind also national legislations. Uh, also, what you should know that it applies to controller or processor and uh, uh, for the EU uh, 
in the EU who process personal data regardless of whether the processing takes place in EU or not. So if you're an EU researcher and you do research in Ghana, so to say, this also applies for you. And also if you're uh, outside the EU, but you process personal data on EU citizens. So these are the two rules that applies for the GDPR. Uh, as I said, uh, all of this is also supplemented by national laws. Next slide, please. Um, so to see what's there in GDPR, um, it's more continuity than change. A lot of things were already defined in previous uh, um, laws and previous uh, directives. Uh, so GDPR has uh, limited flexibility, but leaves room for national supplementary provisions. Um, individuals get more rights. So uh, there's, for example, right for uh, data portability. <clears throat> Institutions will be held more responsible for data that holds, they hold and process. So we are talking about accountability and increased uh, fines for uh, breaching GDPR are defined and uh, of the misuse of the personal data. Uh, then a uh, broad definition of scientific purposes. Here you have uh, in GDPR a clear definition what can be done for the um, scientific research purposes. Uh, then we're also talking about code of conduct for various sectors that are encouraged to be defined and uh, there are new requirements for information to be provided to data subjects. More or less researchers did this by now, uh, but there's now a clear definition of what should be there and it's also good because it gives us some guidance. And also we're talking about new requirements for consent. Next slide, please. So why exactly are we talking about this? As, as researchers in social sciences, it's likely that we'll be collecting personal or even sensitive personal data in our research. So it's usually in social sciences, we are at some point dealing with sexual orientation of our respondents. We ask them about their religion, we might collect some data on health, ethnicity, even biometrical data, but for sure you will at some point uh, collect some of their identifiers. So it might be name, address, phone numbers. It might be even just to, to, to click on saying, yes, this person was uh, addressed and uh, et cetera, but it, it is there. And it's likely also that we'll be collecting some information from social media. So this is why it's really important that we had this in mind and think about it, what we are actually doing with this data and what we need to do. Next slide, please. So uh, let's now define a few um, words that are defined in, in GDPR. So what's a pseudo-anonymization? So when we are talking about handling of personal data in such a way that no individuals can be identified from the data without a key that allows the data to be re-identified. So, so this involves removing or obscuring direct and indirect identifiers. The key must be kept separate and secure. Uh, this is really important for uh, especially sensitive data um, that you actually have this at the beginning when you do the collection, but then as soon as possible, you really try to see the anonymized data and the data that will be used for most of the researchers, especially if you're dealing outside the primary research team, should be either pseudonymized or completely anonymized. Um, so this is explicitly encouraged as a secure measure in the GDPR. Uh, but you also need to know that pseudo-anonymized data or encrypted data are still personal data, so this still applies uh, to GDPR uh, restrictions. Next slide, please. So now we have also a category of anonymous data. Uh, so when this is, uh, so when information does not relate to or identified or identifiable natural person or personal data rendered anonymous in such a manner the data subject is no longer identifiable. Um, so this is uh, how it's defined the anonymous data, but you also need to have in mind that uh, anonymous data should not be irrevocable and you should check uh, regular intervals um, in light of new technologies, whether your data file is still, is still anonymous or not, because further on the line, uh, some researchers might um, uh, you know, post some information on, on Facebook or Twitter or web pages, uh, and this might uh, get your data non de-anonymized. 
but uh, having this in mind, uh, GDPR does not apply to anonymous data, and this is written in Recital 26. So this is why it's really important that as researchers, we try to anonymize data as soon as possible, and we work in anonymous data also to have in mind uh, that we are not going to hurt our individuals that uh, we get their information from. Next slide, please. Um, I already mentioned this, but just to be explicit, so in GDPR, there's a mention of special categories of personal data. So uh, these are the information of racial or ethical origin, uh, political options, opinions. So in social science, it's a lot of things. Uh, religious or uh, philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, and data concerning a health or sex life and sexual orientation, and then also generic data or biometric data. Um, so this could also be defined by some additional national legislations, but this is something that in social sciences we really uh, tackle a lot. Next slide, please. Um, in Article 6 of GDPR, you find six principles that are related to personal data. So what is there defined is that personal data must be processed lawfully, fairly, and in transparent manner and then collected for specific purposes and not processed further for incompatible purposes. Um, but there's an ex exemption for research and archiving purposes in accordance with Article 89. So further processing is with not, not incompatible with original purpose. This is uh, something that is possible. Uh, then uh, personal data must be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary. Uh, so uh, what is also defined in GDPR, if you don't need to collect some personal data, please don't collect it. So it's really important as uh, already Gwen mentioned that you define things really good in data management plan. So what exactly do you need in order to uh, get your results uh, out? Uh, then personal data must be accurate and where necessary up to date. Uh, they must uh, be kept um, in, in identifiable form, no longer than necessary. Uh, so again, we are talking about anonymization, but there's an exemption for research and archiving purposes, again, in Article 18, uh, 89. And personal data must be processed with appropriate security. So we're talking about integrity and confidentiality. Next slide, please. So what exactly are legal grounds for processing our personal data? So most common for researcher of research are um, consent. So defining in art, article six, so consent. And then when we're talking about necessary for the performance of tasks carried out in public interest and necessary for legitimate interests pursued by controller. Uh, but then we have also special categories data. Uh, they are um, prohibited to be collected or even archived, except if we have explicit consent. If we have uh, personal data that are manifested made publicly by the data subjects, um, so there's something that might be publicly available about that. And whether there's a necessity for archiving scientific or statistical purposes in accordance with Article uh, 89 and based on union or member state law. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, coming from the data archive, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this as well. So special provision for archiving and research purposes, uh, again, in accordance with Article 89. So further processing is uh, when it's not considered to be incompatible, incompatible with the initial purpose. And also personal data may be stored for longer periods if necessary. Again, it's good that you do have a consent um, and this is agreed with a respondent. But there are exemptions also from uh, subject rights. Uh, so for the archiving and research, you might, uh, uh, so the exemptions are right to be forgotten, right to object and right, for inf right to information. So if this is something that needs to be archived, it will be archived and these rights don't apply. Next slide, please. But additional to the GDPR, there's also a discussion about research ethics. And research ethics 
you know, they are linked with GDPR, but they are there. And, and we as researchers uh, would need to, you know, um, look at it and, and follow it. So ethics are an integral part of research project from the conceptual stage of the research proposal to the end of the research project. So it's not just something that you do at the beginning when you do the planning, but it's also in all the steps. And that's why it's mentioned in the Horizon 2020 that uh, data management plans is a living document. So you're supposed to think about this and you might need to add information later on in the process. So when we're talking about research ethics, we do have a disciplinary code of ethics, uh, such as, um, for example, American Sociological Association. It's quite a long document, worth reading. And then you might have uh, additional national code of ethics. Uh, so you might have, uh, let's say in Slovenia, we have uh, ethics of a sociological association. Again, there's a lot of information written in there, how you need to conduct research, which information need to be available for other co-researchers and how to go with it. I also put here a link to European Code of Research Integrity, which I guess it deals with a lot of things that we as researchers in Europe do. We have a special uh, university code of ethics, so you might have it as well, and you might have also institutional code of ethics. So please go and check this at your university. Um, Linked to that are research ethic committees. So they are there to check what we want to do as research and then grant if possible. Uh, so kind of request that comes from funders either to, from Horizon 2020 or other EC project or grants is also that um, research is reviewed and um, granted, approved, so to say, by a research ethic committee. And this is something that we see lately uh, with uh, many uh, scientific journals as well, that they ask whether ethical committee approved your research before they publish uh, what you have done. Next slide, please. So I linked here um, some guidelines. Um, so for example, here are guidelines for ensuring compliance with ethical principles that are Horizon 2020. These are the main ethical principles that are mentioned and there's a huge document in the back explaining each and every one of this. But you can see this is a lot of things that I talked before that are in GDPR. So they are there in the ethics um, you know, already. So we need to respect human dignity and integrity. We need to ensure honesty and transparency. Um, we need to protect vulnerable persons, uh, ensure privacy and confidentiality, promote justice, and inclusiveness, minimize harm and maximum benefit, and sharing the benefits that are there with population, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's nothing new what came basically with GDPR, but it's just defined and its legal basis. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about ethical review process, this is something that it should help you as a researcher to think through the ethical issues surrounding your research. So which are the things that you actually need to do? And as mentioned, this is something that could be done by research uh, ethic committee at your university or your institute if you are not certain whether uh, this needs to be uh, done or not and whether you don't have enough knowledge about it, you can always ask um, some colleagues and um, people or research at the committees to help you with this. Uh, so the role of uh, research committee is to protect the safety, right and well-being of research participants and to promote ethically sound research. So it's really important that you think about this um, in advance. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, there's also a document on how to complete your ethics self-assessment from Horizon 2020. Uh, so as already mentioned, uh, consider ethics issue arise in many areas of research. So it's not just um, usual um, medical fields, but also in, in social sciences, psychology, ethnology, etc. Uh, so idea here in the back, as we mentioned, is that you must uh, protect your volunteers, but also yourself and your research colleagues, because they will be looking at the data that you will collect, and this will also expose their, they will have the knowledge. Uh, so it's best that they don't know who the volunteers are if this is not necessary. Uh, it's really important that you start thinking about ethics while designing your research protocols. 
this might um, um, result in, in some additional things that you will need to do. Also, you might want to think about uh, storing, accessing uh, your data, and you might uh, apply uh, to some licenses, to programs, or even to uh, hardware. Uh, and again, uh, first source for this would be your institution that needs to have, uh, usually they have a specialized ethic departments and uh, they can help you with that. Or uh, you might even consider contacting data protection officers that are in each European countries. Next slide, please. So in this document from Horizon 2020, there are several chapters. Uh, one of them is also uh, kind of referring to research that involves human participants. Uh, so you can find there uh, several questions that you need to ask yourself and then uh, documents that you would need to provide in order to ensure that this is so. So if questions goes in direction, um, are there volunteers for social uh, or human science research? Uh, so you would need to provide information like details of recruitment, inclusion and exclusion criteria and informed consent procedures, etc. A special um, care should be taken when you're dealing with vulnerable individuals or group and when you're talking about uh, children and minors. So you need to define a detailed uh, age range, uh, whether you have consent from the parents, whether you need it, uh, and what is justification that uh, explicitly this group needs to be involved in your research and that you cannot exclude them. In all of this, you need to have in mind always potential risk uh, so uh, of misuse of research results. So this is something that you need to have in mind. It's in all cases, in all steps of the research, uh, what kind of data there will be available and what's the potential risk of misuse. Um, this also depends on um, the content of your research. Sometimes it might not be that risky, but sometimes you really ask questions that might influence, especially children later on uh, in their life. And we also had, you know, examples of people that actually did suicides because some results came out we shouldn't have. So uh, you need to be really careful as a researcher for that. Next slide, please. Uh, so additional to, uh, to that, you have a chapter that is dealing with personal data. So these are the questions that you need to ask yourself when you're dealing with personal data. So does your research involve personal data um, collection or processing? Uh, so uh, does it involve sensitive personal data such as health, sexual lifestyle, ethnicity, political options, etc.? cetera? Uh, does it involve processing of uh, genetic information? Uh, does it involve tracking of observation of participants, whether you have IP addresses, cookies, etc. This is something that, you know, it's in the back. Usually it's, it's collected and, and you don't even know about it. So it's really good that you also check whether you, if you're using an um, online survey tool, what are the things that they, they, they collect and which are the things that you will be given um, for that. Uh, what is also written here is uh, that you need to consider, so even if you're not doing uh, a collection, but you're using uh, uh, previously collected personal data, so it's so called secondary data. Uh, so also make sure uh, where there are some um, sensitive personal information there defined and what you will be doing with this. Um, next slide, please. So when you're dealing with personal data, this is the recommendation of what should be provided. Um, so it's kind of details of your procedures of data collection, storage, protection, um, transfer of the data, etc. But it's really important and it's recommended that you have uh, copies of, of notification and then you have uh, information or uh, copies of informed consent forms, so-called so information sheet and other consent documents, especially uh, consent documents is something that you need to prove that you have uh, now in GDPR. And uh, if you are transferring this to non-EU country, you need to have copy of, the, of authorization uh, for that. Next slide, please. Um, so to, to summarize a bit this part, uh, so it's really important that we respect uh, ethical standards. And uh, uh, doing that, uh, it's a combination of uh, uh, consent information sheet and then anonymization, which we already talked about. It's also really important that you define who owns uh, the copyright of your data. 
And uh, uh, especially on the access point, it's important that you define uh, access uh, uh, to, uh, to the data. Um, so this is something that you need to um, think about uh, when you're uh, creating a data management plan. Uh, so what kind of consent will you need? What kind of data you need to collect? And also, uh, please go and check what are the requirements of repositories, because sometimes they are. Uh, there might be requirements on formats. Uh, but also different repositories have different uh, um, agreement and licensing of the data. Uh, so this is a copy of what we use uh, um, and in most cases is used in uh, uh, SESDA archives. So um, basically uh, the most common license is CC BY license, but we also have a, a data set that are licensed as CC0 or CC BY non-commercial depending on, um, on the researcher. Uh, that gives it. Uh, and then you have also uh, access control. So um, user can access this data freely or they can access this via secure environment. Uh, so as Gwen mentioned, it's not, um, it's, it's something that you need to consider what you're depositing to the data archive, but also try to consider which are the rules uh, that are in the back. So um, what are the access um, conditions that you give uh, to this data? Next slide, please. Um, so when we're talking about the consent, consent is needed across the data life cycle. Uh, engagement uh, in the research process need to be defined. So what activities are involved in participating uh, in the project, but you also need to have in mind that it's important that you discuss the dissemination uh, of your results as a presentation, publication, um, in the web, uh, so whether you want to use something that was uh, in the videos or you want to quote some, um, some of the researchers when you're doing qualitative surveys. But you also need to consider um, data sharing and archiving, uh, so consider future use of data. Please don't uh, use wording like, uh, I'll be using this only for this research purposes because this, only li this also limits you as researcher to use this further on. Uh, your work. Uh, so they are wording that are suggested to be used and please try to check them out and use them um, appropriately. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so talking about consent, this is already defined uh, again in GDPR with Article 4 and Article 7. So definition of the consent here is uh, that it, this is any freely given, specific, informed and unambitious indication from a person that affirms that his or her personal data might be processed. So when we're talking about freely given, must be a ge genuine choice. Uh, person need to be able to refuse withdraw without consequences and not be in dependent relationship. So this is not something like you need to answer this survey, uh, otherwise you will not um, be employed in this uh, company anymore or, or a different kind of thing. So it needs to be freely given. Uh, then when we are talking about specific, it not ex it's not explained in GDPR, uh, but there's a guidance from uh, VP29, which are linked here in the slides, so you can check them later. So it talks about clear information on extent and consequences that they are there. So when we're talking about informed, um, content and form requirements should be easily understood, easily accessible, clear and simple language, especially when the information is given to the children. And when we're talking, talking about active, it needs to be opt-in. So silence or pretty boxes are, uh, in a deck, uh, are not valid here. So you need to have possibilities either to ticking boxes or um, usually what's there in a written consent that you have yes and no column and a respondent can tick one of these uh, if needed. Next slide, please. Um, so this is quickly some information about what could be uh, written in the consent. Um, here back at, at this link, uh, uh, there's a link to the um, back of this page, there's a link to the UK uh, DS, uh, so it's uh, English uh, data service where they have information about consent and uh, they already renew it uh, by the GDPR um, rules. So please be free uh, to go and check what's there. 
but in general, um, you need to inform participants about the purpose of the research. You need to discuss what will happen to their contribution. So including the future archiving and sharing of the data, then indicate the steps that will take uh, will be taken to safeguard their anonymity and confidentiality and outline their rights to withdraw, withdraw from the research and how to do this. Next slide, please. And then it's also a uh, best way to archive informed consent for data sharing is to identify the, uh, and explain the possible future use of their data and offer uh, the participants the option to consent on a granular level. So if possible, try to define several steps uh, to which they need to agree. They might agree, let's say, to anonymize transcript, but not on video recordings or audio recordings to be archived and, and copied later on in the, in the archive. Um, so discuss this uh, with your respondents further on, so you will not have any problems later. Next slide, please. Additional to the consent form, it's really important that you also have an information sheet because sometimes it's just not doable that you write everything in a consent form. So you want to have uh, this information in advance, uh, provide this information in advance to your respondents. So usually you would add this uh, when you ask them um, uh, to consent uh, for, for the research. Uh, so you might send this in advance. So information sheet might co uh, consist of uh, different information again, and uh, like uh, purpose of the research, type of research intervention, so which questions, whether it will be questionnaire, interview, focus group, etc. And then uh, that uh, it is voluntary nature uh, of their participation, what are the benefits and risk of participating. So this is also something that you need to consider whether there are some risk for them uh, if they um, participate in your study. And they uh, need to know about procedures for withdrawal from the study um, and uh, usage of data during research, um, usage of data during dissemination and storage, including how the information will be shared with participants and any access, uh, access on uh, benefit sharing that might be applicable. Um, sometimes this is something that you uh, also ask them whether they want to, to know uh, about research and uh, in some cases they, they say yes. Uh, so also define and please add contact details of the researchers uh, with institu institution funding sources and how, um, how they actually can contact if they want to have more information. Next slide, please. So information sheet, uh, when you're dealing with the personal data, uh, there's uh, additional information that should be added. Uh, like, uh, for example, how personal information will be processed and stored and for how long and uh, then procedure for maintaining confidentiality or information about participants and information that participants share, and then also procedure for ensuring ethical use of data, uh, whether you'll be de-identifying uh, this data. Next slide, please. Uh, so I added here um, uh, um, at, at the end example from uh, a series project. Uh, it's also one of the international projects uh, CESDA is involved in. And uh, one of the tasks is dealing with uh, protecting of data. And this is an example what they would write in the information sheet. Uh, like, uh, for example, this is the wording that you can use and adjust uh, in your case. So uh, we will treat all the information about you with strict confidentiality and in accordance with EU general data protection regulation and national data protection laws. So again, it depends on, on the country when you're doing that, this research. And then your name and contact information will be replaced by a code. Only the national team that collects data will be addressed, uh, will have access to the code list. Uh, what we mentioned before, so if possible, try to anonymize data as soon as possible, uh, and then also anonymized data can be shared with others. Uh, so when the survey is finished, the national team will send the data without your name or, or contact details to the specific archive, and this is one of the archive that is mentioned. Um, and then information that your name and contact information will be deleted uh, at a specific year. Uh, the rest of the collection data will be securely stored for an identifiable period. They are made available for use in scientific studies by researchers, students, and other interested in European social attitudes. Next slide, please. 
So further on the line, this suggests to add wording S. There's a slight possibility that some background information, such as citizenship, age, country, overt, occupation, accessory, uh, and a region may identify you. In such cases, access will only be given to the researchers after uh, approved application and confidentiality agreement are in place. So this is what I was talking before. There might be special access conditions where uh, um, if some information in the data set is still uh, in, you know, there, so it could be, it could identify a person. So uh, it's suggested by the archives that uh, um, um, such kind of data is under secure environment and it's access under special agreement. Uh, but it's good that you inform your respondents. So I think that in most cases they agree when they know how the process will be made. Uh, but then, and then also they conclude uh, with things like uh, the result will be published on our website that at that time we'll, we will make every effort to ensure that no participant will be recognized in any publications based on the study. So this is kind of the wording that you could use. So uh, it's not necessary to be using things like uh, for there you will never be uh, recognized because um, nowadays with new technologies, uh, we know that these things might be possible, but it's good that you use a, a specific wording and, and promise as much as you can. Next slide, please. Um, and these are the ethical arguments for archiving the data. So we don't want to be overburdening our um, research groups, especially when we are talking about volunteer groups. Uh, we know uh, today that uh, there are really so many uh, studies going on and if not necessary, please don't try to burden them. So we use uh, secondary uh, data that are available through the data repositories. But then we make best use of hard to obtain data. Uh, so when we are do doing studies on uh, uh, elites and uh, socially excluded and over-research over groups. And what we also do in this case is when you archive data, you extend the voice of participants because other people can, can, can um, hear them, so to say, it's because they research what they do, what they, what they speak. And it's much more things that can be done uh, than only one researcher can do. And it also provides great research transparency, uh, so you can prove the things that you actually uh, did and uh, all of your colleagues can uh, read it in these regards. Um, and I think there's one concluding slide, so please, next slide. Yeah, um, so these are some concluding remarks in relation to GDPR. So GDPR basically, even though it might not seem so, but it is really research friendly and safeguard the interest and the needs of scientific research institution. And the legal basis for processing data for research purposes are largely in place, um, but it's still possible that uh, member uh, states introduce their own rules. Uh, so again, please be careful when you're dealing with that to do check your uh, internal legislation. Uh, it increases risk of identification, creates a need uh, for greater transparency to retain public trust. Um, so this is also one of the things. So public, if you do this kind of things with consent and information letter, uh, respondents will trust you better because you will make sure that they know uh, what's there in the back. Uh, then uh, new requirements for information to be provided and new requirements for consent. Um, so uh, it needs to be easy to uh, withdraw from the study uh, and consent must be documented. This is also something that's important to remember from the GDPR. Um, so I think this is the uh, end of my presentation. I hope I didn't scare you too much, uh, but I started with GDPR and ended with, with ethics because I wanted to let you know that this is something that we as researchers were supposed to do. Uh, you know, uh, from before the GDPR was in place. Um, so um, I'm welcoming now um, the questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Thank you very much, Irene. It was a very thorough presentation, which was very interesting because you covered many topics. Still, we have questions. <laughs> uh, yes. If I may, we have a question related to disciplines that work with sensitive data. Uh, what is the relationship between the GDPR requirements and the open data and uh, those disciplines relating to ad which advice do you have and do you have anything to say about good practices? 
Uh, yes, so um, hmm, complicated. Um, so basically, I think it's, it's, it's really important that anyone that deals with sensitive data do check national legislation because it's not only the GDPR that's in the back. I, I would still recommend uh, data to be as open as possible, meaning that it could be archived in the repository but under restricted access, but it would still be catalogued and metadata information would be available. Uh, through these catalogs. So even though that we are talking about sensitive groups, if uh, if possible, uh, I would still recommend uh, data would be archived uh, in an archive. Hope this gives some information. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Irene, we have uh, an uh, additional questions regarding data transfer to, uh, to non-EU countries by international mm -hmm. organizations or, or by multinational companies uh, what body or uh, institution uh, w w um, is in charge of controlling that data transfer uh, yeah again um, a hard, hard one because this is something that is uh, is not really clear um, at, at this point um, so uh, there are uh, regulations different from, from country to country, uh, additional to GDPR. And for example, in, in CESDA archives, we are now working on the joint catalog, but we didn't decide to have a, a, a database at, at one place, but to still have it on, uh, on national repositories because of these uh, conditions that are defined by, uh, by different countries. Uh, but it is possible to, to, to move uh, data and it's possible to have a joint repository, especially uh, if you want to compare uh, some sort of data when you're doing, um, uh, um, you know, um, modeling um, in, in statistical uh, data. Uh, so it's possible, but usually it's defined by uh, a separate uh, conditions and separate regulations uh, in, in a country itself. We know, for example, that uh, there are some secure rooms um, that are linking uh, different uh, countries, uh, but not all. Uh, so I would recommend again uh, to go uh, and check national legislation in this relation, because this is not only to be dealt with GDPR. Thank you very much. Um, I think we don't have more questions, so I would like to thank again the two speakers. It was really great to having, having you with us with your very clear and thorough presentations. I would also like to thank all the participants for being with us. And um, I would like to ask them to spend some more minutes in the future uh, filling in the feedback forms that you will receive. We also invite you to uh, visit uh, our um, uh, uh, NCP network, the Net for Society website, where you can uh, check uh, all the events uh, related with uh, socioeconomic science uh, in Horizon 2020. And uh, that's all from uh, our side. Thank you. Thank you, and talk to you in the future. <laughs>